But what we know is that these tumors are driven by one of these pathways that Ruth has beautifully shown you before. And that kinase pathway is well recognized as being a cause of low-grade astrocytoma. If you have a condition called neurofibromatosis, then this gene here, neurofibromin, is blocked. And what that leads to is an activity of another gene called RAS, and that leads to cell proliferation. So people who have neurofibromatosis are prone to developing tumors spontaneously. What you can also happen in, in, in patients who have benign brain tumors, low-grade astrocytomas, just because of bad luck, is you can get a mutation of other genes, and this one is called RAF, and that can be locked in the on position, and that can directly lead to cell proliferation as well. So we know that RAF is a very important gene uh, causing low-grade astrocytoma. And in fact, if you identify RAF, RAS as a BMF as, a, as a, a cause of your tumor, we know that this is an important prognostic factor. So again, we can stratify. We can look to patients who have got a good, relatively good, or bad outcome based on whether they have a genetic mutation or not. This is a really important tool. It means that we can make a decision about how we treat people in the future. So we can look at the patients who, who, who have <coughs> different strategies for treatment, and hopefully, in time, we can start looking for targets for therapy. So, there are four trials we're looking at now which are specifically identifying this, this pathway using non-chemotherapy drugs. So chemo drugs that you wouldn't normally regard as being conventional chemotherapy, they're inhibiting these enzymes, blocking the pathway and hopefully causing responses to these tumors. So that's an example of how stratification and understanding how a tumor is developing can give you a further insight. Here's another example. So this is metalloblastoma. Metalloblastoma is a high-grade malignant tumor it affects the, the bottom half of the brain called the cerebellum. And on the left hand side is a patient who's got a lump right in the middle of the cerebellum. On the right is a patient who has a lump and they have numerous dots all around the brain. And those are metastases. This is the main problem of metallomastoma. Over the years, we've had an improvement in overall survival for people who've had metallomastoma. And these are successive cohorts, rather similar to the one you've seen previously. And those improvements were marginal. But what's been very good is that the most recent study, PNET4 study, which is an international collaboration, has shown a very significant improvement in outcome because of systematic treatment. And this in the context of reducing the amount of radiotherapy that we're doing. So we've made a very significant improvement now. That's great. But that's not the whole story. Over the past five years, it's been very clear that actually we're not dealing with metallocastinium of one type. We're in fact dealing with a number of different diseases, all of which we've been calling metalloblastoma. The first two that were identified were driven by two separate pathways, one's called WINT and one's called Sonic Hedgehog. Sonic Hedgehog, by the way, if you, if you identify a gene, you get to call the pathway or something and call it what you want and say, because all these guys are such nerds, they all play together all the time, they call it Sonic, Sonic Hedgehog. So WINT and Hedgehog pathways are driving two particular types of metalloblastoma. And that's an important consideration. It also incidentally means that they arise in different parts of the brain. When you look deeper and you're using more, so, uh, more uh, sophisticated techniques, in fact, it's been possible to identify at least four types of metalloblastoma. Wind and Sonic and then people ran out of names, so they called it group three and group four. <laughs> now, why does that matter? Well, one of the things is that these, 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 these tumors arise at different ages. So what you see, for example, is that the wind pathway is more common in older children. The sonic hedgehog pathway is very common in, in infants and very common in adults. If you <coughs> not that it's very common, but it's more, more frequent in adults. Group three is more common in young children, and group four is common in older children. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because of this. If you look at the overall survival of children who've got each of these different types of tumor, you can see that they're short and cheese. The wind pathway tumors is perhaps the most striking. With conventional therapy of wind tumors, almost nobody dies. You've had a nearly 100% likelihood of being cured from the amygdala by conventional treatment. And that's fantastic. You know you've got a wind tumor, you want to know that. What it also means is that we're probably giving too much therapy to these patients. And actually, we could afford to pull back. We know that the main complication of children who have amygdala blastoma in childhood is the neurodevelopmental damage that we cause by giving radiotherapy. So if we can pull back and give less radiotherapy, then we have a real chance of improving their outcome. The second graph shows you what happens in infants. So an infant brain is very, very susceptible to damage. 
You could really see that picture of a baby of three or four, a child of three or four, then you will cause very profound disability. So if we can get away without being raised therapy, then that's what we should try and think about. And the group where we might concentrate that is the Sonic Hedgehog Pathway Driven Group. So we have a possibility for stratification, we might reduce late effects, and actually we may also have new therapeutic targets. So LDE225 specifically targets the Sonic Hedgehog Pathway. So we may again be able to treat these, these tumours without ever intervening with normal chemotherapy ultimately. Uh, and this is a kind of a trial which is currently open. Okay, new techniques. This is the end, coming towards the end. Very rarely in, in your professional life do you, do, you, do you really feel humbled by people's abilities. And I have to say that, that, that some of my colleagues in Bristol have done things which uh, it's akin to Star Trek, actually, the stuff they're doing. And I want to share it with you because I'm, I'm just so excited by this. I'm going to talk to you about this tumor, which is a diffuse. Intrinsic pontine astrocytoma. Okay, these are horrible tumors. The survival for these, these, these children is nearly zero. You can see there's no, no line on it, it's all on the bottom. So, children must, children manage to live for about nine months before they die. If you give radiotherapy, you might improve the survival by three months. This is a truly awful tumor. It's a hybrid astrocytoma. Bruce alluded to that at the end of his last talk of the midbrain and the pons in the middle, and you can't see it surgically because that is such an excess of the part of the brain. My colleagues in Bristol have developed this system where in patients with an unrelated condition, Parkinson's disease, they've been infusing therapies straight into the brain tissue. They've been using microcatheters going straight into the deep parts of the brain and infusing for uh, uh, over a year at times with these various catheters like this. This is an ideal situation for replicating in the context of an inaccessible tumour. So, they developed a robot which will allow you to accurately uh, in, 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 uh, implant microcatheters which are a diameter which is less than a millimetre across. The accuracy is within 0.3 of a millimetre at the end of, of, of the, 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 the needle. So the, the, the catheter is, the robot is used to implant the catheter and the catheters are inserted manually, and then these are brought together into this little thing here, which is a sort of micro, micro port. Some of you may know what a port of catheters for delivering a chemotherapy into the blood vessels. Well, this is an equivalent of delivering chemotherapy directly into the brain. And this is an example of how the system might be set up, where you have a number of different lumens for these going into specific catheters, which then go to the brain. And different catheters can go to different ports. All of this is done on a fairly tiny scale. <coughs> this is an example of the first patient in Europe ever treated with this, this treatment. A um, patient of mine who had a brainstem gliana. And the red area is the volume of infusion that we were able to achieve for this young man. This is another patient who had an anaplastic astrocytoma. So this is an adult patient, in fact, who had a very extensive tumor which essentially was outlined by the blue area. Chemotherapy was instilled by four separate ports and managed to deliver chemotherapy to that area. This patient had a, a, an absolutely astonishing response to treatment. We've treated five patients in Bristol so far. Um, these patients have not been made worse by the treatment. One patient has made a remarkable recovery. The other patients have succumbed to their disease. The point being that this is a, this is a potential change where no change has been before. And we're now hoping to start a clinical trial as soon as we can get the funding whereby we're giving infusions of chemotherapy in patients just after diagnosis for uh, the first three to four months. So, just to summarise, what we're interested in here today is everything that we've talked about already, which is identifying good risk groups and bad risk groups, individualising therapy, and where possible to, to, to take advantage of any improvements in technology which made significant advances. Thank you.